Hello, my name is Bill Houlihan, and I've been asked to talk to you in relation to the question of a possible career in ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. Um, in particular, I understand that the query arose in the context of a possible career as an arbitrator, but arbitration is only one of a number of alternative forms of uh, ADR, and I'll explain what they are, and I'll explain about the career paths that are available in each of them. Um, it's very unusual in one sense to have somebody who would set out at the very outset to develop a career as an ADR practitioner. Uh, there are a few and they are exceptional, but generally speaking people would get into alternative dispute resolution through some kind of primary profession. So for example, I'm a solicitor and I'm also one of the first senior counsel solicitors in Ireland having been appointed last year. And I do do a lot of work as an alternative dispute resolution practitioner. Uh, in the area of arbitration and mediation in particular. But there are other forms as well and other practitioners from other professional fields, for example, quantity surveyors, architects, engineers, they would also get into uh, ADR. And again, depending on where they're coming from, they tend to focus on particular types of work. So for example, somebody coming from one of the construction professions would tend to focus on things like construction disputes or contractual disputes relating to payments under construction contracts. But I'll explain the background here first, and then I'll explain uh, the different types and uh, how you might go about developing a career in it. So firstly, um, I want to look at the whole question of the nature of ADR and exactly what it is. There's a clue in the title. It's Alternative Dispute Resolution, and it's uh, the alternative to going to court. Because when you go to court, you very rarely will find that you'll have a win-win. Generally speaking, someone wins, someone loses. Sometimes people feel that both sides lose. If only because the costs of litigation now are so expensive. The outgoing Chief Justice Frank Clark has commented publicly on the cost of litigation. And he has said that only the very poor or the very rich could really afford to go all the way to court. Sometimes uh, people of necessity have to compromise. And depending on the route that they choose, there are alternatives, some of which could be cheap. So you have, under a general heading of what's called determinative ADR, you have arbitration and expert determination. Now, arbitration is essentially a system whereby, rather than going to court and have a judge decide in public what the issues are between the parties, the rights and wrongs of a case, uh, and determine what people's rights or obligations might be, you pick an arbitrator or an arbitrator is appointed in accordance with a specified uh, nomination process, for example. And that person then acts in essence as a private judge. They sit in private, it's completely confidential, and they will issue a decision at the end of it. Their decision is called an award. In court, the decision will be called a judgment and they will be backed up by an order. One of the advantages, as I say, is that it is private and confidential, um, but in the same way that a court judgment can be enforced, an arbitrator's award can also be enforced if necessary. Another example of determinative ADR is what's called expert determination, and that's where, um, unlike an arbitration where the arbitrator, like a judge in court, receives evidence and doesn't decide on the basis of their own opinion, but decides on the evidence that is put before them, in an expert determination, the expert is recruited because of their expertise and they decide, based on their expert knowledge, what the uh, result should be. You can also have, <coughs> uh, under the general heading of non-determinative but indicative ADR, you can have what's called early neutral evaluation. Now, early neutral evaluation is again where you get somebody in who would be particularly expert or skilled in a particular area um, or would be very knowledgeable in relation to a particular subject and they're invited to come in to look at the situation and to give an evaluation. It's not binding, it's not determinative, it's merely an indication as to what the likelihood would be. And that can be very valuable in circumstances where people do not necessarily want to incur the cost of going to court and having a lengthy and expensive trial in order to find out what a view would be. So they agree on somebody who would be neutral and in all of these things, the essence is that the person would be neutral and there'd be no conflicts of interest. They wouldn't have any skin in the game, so to speak. And they would give their evaluation of what the likely outcome would be. That could 
influence the parties in terms of coming to a settlement. You also have what's called non-determinative and non-indicative uh, ADR. And under that heading, you have facilitation and conciliation. Um, conciliation is kind of mediation plus, and I'll explain in more detail what mediation is later. But mediation is where you uh, have a mediator as an independent person who tries to help the parties identify a solution that would be acceptable to them both. Conciliation can go a little bit further and a conciliator may be asked to make a recommendation to the parties as to the basis on which they might try and resolve their disputes. Uh, generally speaking, conciliation would be non-binding or non-indicative. Um, in other words, it's merely a recommendation. It's the opinion of the conciliator or it's uh, an indication as to what their thoughts might be. And it's a matter for the parties to decide whether they want to accept that or not. Facilitation is similar. Uh, it's where somebody facilitates the parties in trying to negotiate and act as a go-between between them, particularly in circumstances where the relationships might be strained. You can also have um, what's called uh, straightforward negotiation. In the context of litigation, you often hear of something being settled on the steps of the court. And literally, that can be true. Or it could be that it's settled in the, inside a courthouse somewhere the most famous one, of course, in Ireland being the four courts. And uh, a lot of cases are settled in what's called the round hall of the four courts as a result of negotiations. But negotiation is a bit like uh, a, a poker game. You don't know what the other side are necessarily willing to compromise for. And it is a question of trying to uh, negotiate a way to a settlement. The most well-known, perhaps, in recent years of non-determinative mediation our processes of ADR is by mediation. Um, and mediation, as I say, is a process where you, buy, you get an independent uh, third party neutral to come in who gets to know each side's full position in confidence. And that information cannot be shared with the other party. But it has the advantage that the Humpty Dumpty is sitting on the wall with lugs long enough to make sure he doesn't fall. Um, the mediator gets to see both sides of the argument, assuming it's a two sided uh, matter and can see where the grounds for possible compromise might lie. Um, if the parties are upfront with the mediator and explain what their true position is in relation to possible settlement, the mediator might then see that there is an overlap and try and guide the parties towards that area. Another great advantage of mediation, uh, outside of arbitration and uh, litigation, which are the determinative process, is that you can bring in things which a court or an arbitrator could not. So, for example, uh, when you go to court or you go to arbitration, the process is there to try and determine what somebody's rights are or what their obligations are. In a mediation, say, for example, in an employment situation, it might be that someone could, could add value by getting a reference um, in terms that would be more enhanced than, a, say, a simple bald statement that Joe Bloggs was employed by us from X date to Y date uh, and his duties comprised of the following. Um, that can be brought into the, the mix and it can add value to the, the whole equation. There's no single definition of ADR, but one definition which was offered was that it's a broad spectrum of structured processes, including mediation and conciliation, but which does not involve litigation, uh, linked, possibly linked to or integrated with litigation, and which involves the assistance of a neutral third party, which empowers the parties to resolve their own disputes. That was the definition that was put forward by the Law Reform Commission in its consultation paper on ADR, published as far back as 2008. Um, and then equally the European Commission has uh, provided a definition and the LRC in their 2010 report also uh, put forward um, definitions in relation to it. I've already explained in, in broad terms what the uh, different types of um, ADR are. And conciliation in the uh, 2010 report from the LRC is defined as a facilitative, confidential, structured process in which an independent third party called the conciliator actively assists the parties in their attempts to reach, on a voluntary basis, a mutually acceptable agreement to resolve the dispute. Uh, and they sought to define mediation as a facilitative and confidential structured process in which the parties attempt by themselves on a voluntary basis 
to reach a mutually acceptable solution and agreement to resolve the dispute with the assistance of the Inadena Third Party Co Mediator. Now, conciliation um, differs from arbitration in that in the conciliation process, and of itself, it has no legal standing, and the conciliator has no authority to seek evidence or call witnesses, usually writes no decision, makes no award, and as I say, uh, comes to a, a recommendation. Um, it also is confidential, and essentially, to use a common phrase, it all happens without prejudice. Similarly, with mediation, uh, the process is given a confidential status by statute, Section 10 of the Mediation Act 2017, and it is off the books, so to speak. It, it doesn't uh, feature as part of the record, except for the fact that a mediation may have taken place. In terms of the routes to um, getting involved as a practitioner in ADR, just in my own story, I describe myself as a reformed litigator who, having worshipped in the satanic church of litigation for 25 years, converted to the one true church of mediation over 15 years ago. Um, I have been involved in the world of arbitration since my early 20s when I was practicing as a solicitor and it was not unusual to find that you'd have a contract which would provide that rather than going to court the parties would submit the dispute to an arbitrator for decision. For example the standard law society um, property purchase contract would incorporate that and it wasn't unusual as well to find things like shareholders agreements or uh, commercial agreements of one kind or another would incorporate an arbitration clause. Sometimes there would be a procedure uh, provided for the appointment so that you'd have a nominating body. For example, Engineers Ireland or perhaps the Law Society would nominate the arbitrator. Um, but equally you could have uh, agreement between the parties that they would try to identify and agree a suitable arbitrator. Generally speaking, what would happen is that the each side would put forward a list of three people that they would nominate as an arbitrator, and if the lists happened to coincide uh, in terms of a common name, they might pick that person. Again, generally speaking, it would be somebody who would be uh, known to have a particular expertise or knowledge or whose legal skills or analytical skills would be well regarded. You don't have to be a lawyer to be an alternative dispute practitioner. Um, one of the best... Uh, mediators that I know of in recent years started life as a fitter uh, and through industrializations then got involved in um, workplace dispute resolution and mediation. So you to try and identify somebody who has expertise. The difficulty with all of this is that, as I've already mentioned, confidentiality. The processes that are involved in ADR take place behind closed doors. Only the parties who are actually involved know about and get to see who's involved. So uh, you, if you were trying to track down a suitable arbitrator for a particular type of dispute, you'd have to make inquiries as to who has a reputation. And again, it's only people who've already had experience of uh, the ADR practitioner to be able to say, you know, this person is good. So how does somebody go from being a fitter to become a mediator? Well, um, as I've already said, somebody got involved in workplace mediation uh, or dispute resolution and then got involved in mediation. There are a number of mediation training bodies and dispute resolution training bodies that can provide training in specialised areas. Um, so, for example, in relation to mediation, you have a number of uh, service providers in Ireland who would uh, provide training in the area of mediation. You have the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. I'm a former chairman of the Irish branch of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Um, and that is a very broad church. The title suggests that it's limited to arbitrators, but in fact it includes conciliators, facilitators, adjudicators, expert determinators, um, and it provides training in each of uh, the particular areas. So somebody who starts off in a particular area of work could undertake training with these bodies, uh, and the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators is not the only body which would provide training, but the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, as I say, provides training in all facets. Most of the other bodies that provide training are specialised in the particular area of interest. So for example, the Mediators Institute of Ireland doesn't provide training in arbitration. It obviously provides training in mediation. Um, there's a, other, other groups such as Friary Law, CEDAR, the Centre for Effective Dispute Resolution in London. Again, these are mediation training bodies. Um, generally speaking, uh, the 
courses that one would sign up for uh, to undertake training in these areas and become an accredited uh, mediator or uh, arbitrator, you'd be committing to a course of up to 50 hours training. That gives you the badge. Uh, after that, it's a question of getting experience and getting work. So generally speaking, what people would do is they would try to tag along with an experienced mediator or an experienced arbitrator um, and act as a kind of an assistant mediator or an assistant arbitrator uh, during the course of uh, a particular process. And then they would try and gain experience, they'd gain insight into how these things work in practice. And then they would hope that they would, in due course, uh, possibly get a name for uh, being somebody who's good or who might be asked by one of the parties who was involved in one of these processes that they would undertake uh, a mediation or an arbitration. Um, generally speaking as well, to try and get the, the name out there, so to speak, you have to do a little bit of advertising and self-promotion. You'd have to offer to speak at seminars, write papers in relation to uh, various topics. And again, this is to try and create a profile, spread a message, and enlist the interest of people in relation to um, the particular area. Now, there are some focused or specialist groupings as well. So, for example, the Irish Commercial Mediators Association uh, is a body made up of people who are interested in particular in commercial mediation, um, an area that you'll hear a lot of mentioned in terms of mediation, for example, is family law. And there are specialist uh, groups in relation to uh, training on that as well. Mediators Institute, for example, um, would do a lot of training in the kind of the softer areas, non-commercial uh, work areas, such as family law, uh, elder mediation, community mediation, and that type of thing. Um, you also have the International Center for Dispute Resolution, which is a US body. Uh, and in Ireland, you also have Friary Law, which is a training and an accreditation organization. So you can undertake training with these groups, so you learn the hows. Uh, but after that, it really is a question of trying to get into the um, actual ADR world. And that does uh, involve trying to establish links with people who are already involved in this area of work. And that generally arises because you'd link up with them, meet with them, and discuss things with them through membership of one or other of these ADR bodies. The, in terms of the, the statutory regulation of all of these things, the, in terms of arbitration, the Arbitration Act um, doesn't set out any uh, required qualifications for a, an arbitrator. Anybody can be an arbitrator as long as the parties are agreeable. There is a default appointment position uh, provided for under the Act that if parties can't agree to appoint an arbitrator or if an agreement was silent as to how an arbitrator would be appointed, an application can be made to the High Court to appoint somebody. But generally speaking, as you might imagine, the courts in those circumstances tend to appoint lawyers and senior counsel barristers in particular. Um, I'm not aware of any appointment uh, when the court was asked to nominate somebody or appoint somebody uh, of somebody who was not a senior counsel barrister. In terms of um, mediators, for example, then in terms of appointment, sometimes you'll find uh, an agreement might provide that somebody like the Mediators Institute or the president of the Law Society would be asked to nominate a mediator. Now, it doesn't bode well if parties were trying to get into a process whereby the outcome was determined by them, um, if they can't even agree on the choice of the mediator. But sometimes it does happen that the nom a nominating body would be asked to nominate uh, a suitable mediator. And again, depending on the nature of the dispute, geographical considerations, so that the, the ADR practitioner would be somewhere nearby, um, somebody would be selected and would be appointed in those circumstances uh, as the ADR practitioner. In terms of conciliation, um, there is the Construction Contracts Act of 2013, which was an initiative by Senator Fergal Quinn uh, to get over the problem where subcontractors on large building projects might not be paid. And it introduced a process whereby somebody can go for adjudication, um, which is a temporarily binding decision. So, and the whole process has to be completed in a period of uh, 30 days or less uh, it's possibly extended. So the idea is that you have a, a quick and short, sharp in, uh, interaction. The parties submit their case to the adjudicator 
and the adjudicator issues their determination in relation to the matter. Unless, and that view is binding and requires payment, it's usually contract payments to be the issue uh, that's involved, and it requires payment of the amount to be claimed by the subcontractor. Pending final determination by either an arbitrator, if the matter goes on to arbitration, or a judge in the court hearing if it goes on there. Um, the process of, of uh, identification of the adjudicators in that particular situation is that the minister uh, appoints a panel of adjudicators and the chair of the panel appoints people on a rotational basis drawn from the panel as and when requests come in to a, the chairperson are, are made to appoint. There's a recruitment process which is conducted by the Public Appointments, Appointments Commission uh, public point service and uh, there is a competitive interview process and then people are appointed to the panel. Generally speaking again uh, there are people of expertise in that area. The vast majority of them will be drawn from a construction law background uh, or a construction professional background rather than lawyers. The lawyers are actually in a minority in that sense. So th that's uh, kind of a, a broad general overview in relation to the different types of, of areas of work and how somebody might get involved in and uh, gain experience of the different areas of work. I'm happy at any stage if someone wants to have a one-to-one -one chat in relation to the matter, they can give me a call. Um, my office number is 021430734 or you can email me on my email which is bill at hulahanglaw.ie that's B-I-L-L-H-O-L-O-H-A-N-L-A-W dot I-E Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much.